Before I introduce Neil Phillip, and it's a real honor to have him here today, I'd like to thank the members of last year's Instructionally Related Activities Grant Committee for awarding us the funds that made today's event possible. I'd also like to thank the Department of English and Comparative Literature, our three National Center for the Study of Children's Literature graduate students, Sophie, Natalie, and Ashley, who make my life infinitely easier than it could have been, as well as Kim Navarro, the English and Comparative Literature's administrative assistant. Without her help putting this thing together, I would have been lost. My name is Joseph, and I'm the director of the National Center for the Study of Children's Literature, whose home is in the College of Arts and Letters here at SDSU. Each year, the center invites one, sometimes two, scholars in the areas of children's and young adult literature and childhood studies to speak to our faculty, graduate students, undergraduates, and community members. This year, our two scholars are Ebony Thomas and Neil Phillip. Ebony will speak next month in April, so look for that. But today, however, we welcome Neil Phillip, and I just can't adequately express how excited I am to share his work with you. I first encountered Neil's contributions to the field back in 1999, shortly after the publication of the revised edition of the new Oxford book of children's verse. He was the editor. I was working on my PhD at the time, and his anthology played a large role in my decision to make children's poetry my main area of research. In fact, after encountering this little book here, and this is the very copy that I bought all those years ago, I searched out Neil's other work, discovering his interest in folklore and mythology two subjects dear to me. Neil also admires cats, an appreciation we share. When he speaks of his 20-year-old 20, 20 cat, uh, Ariel, enjoying a restorative walk in the garden, if the light's just right, you can catch a glimpse of a kind of veiling flare, an ineffable something I detect in Neil's best writing, for he has a way of seeing that comes as much from his long study of mythology, folklore, mythopoesis, as it does from walking garden paths and living among cats. Neil has spent decades honing his skill at communicating that which resists telling, making in scores of books and essays those connections that are too often, too often invisible, enriching our world by revising, revisioning our poetic, mythological, folkloric, and literary historical traditions. And that's no small thing. Now, before I turn the mic over to Neil, I want to take a moment to read one of his poems. I didn't ask permission, so I hope you'll forgive me. It's called Continental Shift. Continental Shift. We struggle to explore it, this strange universe of self. The mountain ranges flung up of a sudden while we sleep. The arid deserts where nothing will grow the rainforest ringing with unexplained hoots and cries, the subterranean hollows heavy with the drip of water as it turns to stone, the vast reserves of energy lurking beneath tumultuous seas, the jade flare across the blood-orange sunset illuminates our naked flesh, the stars of the night sky blind us with earth's shine. Here we stand, self-created worlds, half wrapped in darkness, half clothed in perfect light. And with that, let's welcome Neil. Thank you so much, Joseph. Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for coming to this talk. I wish I could actually be in San Diego to give it. It's a weird world we're living in. But I hasten to add, nothing like as weird as the world of the fairy tale. Everyone knows how fairy tales start. Once upon a time, and how they end, and they lived happy ever after. But in this talk, I'm going to look at some fairy tales where this isn't true at all. I'm just going to go and shut another door in the house because my wife's watching this and it's echoing. Sorry about that. While the orally transmitted wonder tale does typically feature a pattern of hardships overcome and love or a fortune won, there are many tales that end in grief or disappointment. 
For instance, there is a distinctive Mexican take on the international tale of the maiden who seeks her brothers. In Grimm, the brothers are turned into birds, swans or ravens, and redeemed by their sister. But in Mexico, they're turned into oxen. And here's the thing. In some tellings, they're turned back into human beings, but in others, they are not. There's just no way back. As Jack Zipes writes in Why Fairy Tales Stick, the notion of the happy fairy tale ending became an, in, became an ideological notion mainly in the 19th century. And even then, many authors such as George MacDonald and Oscar Wilde explored the disappointment of hope and unhappiness in their fairy tales. Another important writer on the fairy tale, Max Luti, writes of fairy tales with unhappy endings, such as the Grimm's Fisherman and his wife, in which the characters end up back living in the chamber pot where they started, as anti-fairy tales. But he also notes a tendency of both the fairy tale and the anti-fairy tale to integrate their opposites. This has something to do with our innate sense of the shape of a satisfying story. It's not the happy ending that's important, he writes, but the exactness of composition. There are even variants of that greatest of wish fulfillment tale type Cinderella that end sadly. The Brazilian tale Dona Labismina, for instance, closes on a distinctly unhappy note. It tells of a princess, Maria, who is born with a snake coiled round her neck, from which she is never parted except when she strolls by the sea and the snake, Labismina, frolics in the waves. Eventually, after telling Maria that if she, if she is ever in trouble, she must call for her, La Bismina plunges into the sea and does not come back. The queen sickens and before she dies, gives the king a ring saying, if he ever, if he ever wants to remarry, he must marry the girl whose finger fits the ring. As fairy tale fate would have it, the only girl whose finger fits is Maria, the king's own daughter. In her trouble, Maria goes to the shore and calls for Labismina, who advises her to stall the king by asking for firstly address the colour of a field with all its flowers, secondly address the colour of the sea with all its fishes, and thirdly address the colour of the sky with all its stars. While the king's marriage plans are delayed by this stratagem, Labismina builds Maria a ship. When the dresses are ready, so is the ship, and she tells Maria, her sister, to sail away in it and to marry the prince of whichever country it lands in. When she is married, Maria must call her sister three times and Labismina will be disenchanted from her snake shape and become a princess too. All goes to plan. While working as a poultry maid, Maria wears the three dresses to three days of festival and the prince falls so deeply in love with the mystery girl that he takes to his sick bed. As usual in Cinderella tales of this donkey skin type, only the lowly maid can tempt him to eat and recognizing her by a token, in this case, a ring he has given her, he asks her to marry him. So there is great joy in feasting and there we have our happy ending. Except Maria forgets to call her snake sister. So Labismina has never been disenchanted. And that is why even today, the sea still roars at times and lashes itself into a fury. It is the lonely fate of Donna Labismina that sticks in the mind, not the happy one of Princess Maria. There's a Zuni version of Cinderella, the poor turkey girl, in which the heroine is dressed in finery by her turkeys so that she can attend the festival of the dance of the sacred bird, which she longs to do. The turkeys replace her rags with beautiful garments and circle about her, singing and singing, clucking and clucking, brushing her with their wings until her person was as clean and her skin as bright as that of the fairest maiden. The turkey girl goes to the dance and is so swept up in the excitement and all the attention paid to her that she dances and dances, forgets all about the turkeys who are waiting faithfully for her return. When she does at last remember them, she finds they've broken out of their cage and run away. She follows them calling, but they just quicken their pace. She cannot catch up with them. Eventually, she can run no further. 
Looking down, she sees that her beautiful garments are now filthy rags. She is stained with dust and sweat. Once more, she is the poor turkey girl. Only now she has even lost her turkeys. There's a similar Santal version from Eastern India, the boy and his stepmother, that features a male Cinderella, as often happens. He's a poor boy who spends each day tending a cow. The cow asks him why he's so thin, and he tells the cow that his stepmother is starving him. So the cow, taking the fairy godmother role, which is very often enacted by a helpful animal, tells him to go into the jungle and fetch leaves to make a plate and cup. Then the cow shakes boiled rice onto the plate from one horn and a relish for the rice from the other horn into the cup. This happens every day until the boy grows sleek and fat. The stepmother gets wind of what's happening and feigns sickness, saying she will only get better if the cow is killed. The boy warns the cow, which tells him to hold tight to her tail when they come to tether and slaughter her. When the axe comes down, the rope breaks, and the cow and the boy are carried far away on the wind to a new jungle. There the cow gives birth to many more cows, a whole herd of them, and these cows in turn give birth to a second herd. So now the boy is rich. He drives his two herds to the river so they can drink, and afterwards the boy bathes and washes his hair, a single strand of which falls out and is carried downstream to where a princess is bathing. She picks out the lustrous hair, 12 cubits long, and so admires it, she declares she will marry the man to whom the hair belongs. So far, so good. The boy, persecuted by his stepmother, has been aided by the helpful animal. It is not explicitly in this tale, the spirit of his dead mother, though this is a very deeply embedded motif in Cinderella tales, that the deceased mother's love and protection continue after death. His identifying token has been found by the princess who has fallen in love with him. What could possibly go wrong? After the court barber is unable to locate a man with beautiful hair 12 cubits long, the king's tame parrot is sent to fly across the land and seek him out. It is evening when she finds him. His two herds of cattle are shut up in their pen and he is dressing his hair, his flute hanging on a bush by his side. The parrot steals the flute and lures the boy bit by bit through the jungle and back to the king's palace. His hair is measured, and yes, it is 12 cubits long. So the poor boy and the princess are betrothed, and as it is so late, the boy is entreated to stay the night. Next morning, the boy sets out to the jungle to fetch his cows. It's a long way, and by the time he arrives, it is already late. The cows are angry at having been penned up for so long. And when he lets them out, they knock him down and trample on him. And in the process, they pull out all his beautiful hair, leaving him bald. Nothing daunted, the boy begins to drive the cows back to the king's palace. But one by one, they vanish. So when he arrives, he only has a few left. He tells the king what has happened. But as his hair is all gone, the princess refuses to marry him. He has lost everything. Instead of becoming the king's son-in-law, he is made a servant. The motif of seeking out a spouse through finding a randomly cast hair, which is here the equivalent of the prince finding Cinderella's glass slipper or the glove that other Cinderella figures lose, is a very old one. It can be found in the ancient Egyptian tale Anpu and Bata, or the two brothers, preserved in a papyrus dating from about 1250 BCE. In other Indian tales, the long beautiful hair is usually shed by a woman, and it may be that there is an element of parody in the boy and his stepmother, and that the storyteller is deliberately subverting our expectation of a happy ending, a comic effect. The extent to which storytellers enjoy playing with audiences' preconceived ideas about story structure hasn't been fully explored. There is, for instance, a comic English gypsy variant of The Water of Life, mixed with elements of Sleeping Beauty, told by a master storyteller, Timey Boswell, who also told a wonderful Cinderella story of the donkey skin type, Mossy Coat. In Timey's Lousy Jack and his 11 brothers, the youngest son happens on the frozen in time castle where the sleeping beauty lies beneath a heap of thorns, purely by chance, and makes his way through the thorns, 
not to rescue the princess, but because being such a lousy fella, he liked the scratching he got. He wakes the spellbound princess purely by accident. As usual in Water of Life stories, the Eleven Brothers try to drown Lousy Jack in a ditch, and each in turn claims it was he who woke the princess, but none of them know the crucial detail about the scratching. So when Jack finally turns up, the princess knows he is telling the truth, and she does marry him. But to the end of his days, he was a lousy fellow and liked a good scratching. This isn't exactly a tale that ends badly, but it is one that expertly makes mock of everything we expect a fairy tale to be. One tale with which we are all familiar, Charles Perrault's 1697 Little Red Riding Hood, has a distinctly downbeat ending. When Little Red Riding Hood admires grandmother's teeth, the gleeful reply is, all the better to eat you with. And with these words, that wicked wolf leapt upon Little Red Riding Hood and ate her. And that's it. It was the Brothers Grimm in their 1812 version of Little Red Cap who added the huntsman or woodcutter who chances along to cut Little Red Riding Hood and her grandmother from the wolf's belly and give us the expected happy ending that Perrault so resolutely avoids. The history of Little Red Riding Hood doesn't, of course, start with Perrault or Grimm. Graham Anderson's fairy tale in the ancient world traces it right back to ancient Greece. The Grimms collected the tale from their friends and informants, Marie and Jeanette Hassenflug, who are presumed to have found it in Perrault. The heroine's red cap is a marker of Perrault's influence on subsequent tellings. It doesn't feature in many of the 35 oral French variants to be found in Delarue and Tenez's tale type index of the French folk tale. In the most typical French versions, the girl is served her grandmother's flesh and blood for her meal by the werewolf who has killed and impersonated the grandmother. She gets into bed with the werewolf and only escapes by pretending she needs to relieve herself and going out into the yard. It's a pretty hard hitting story and you can find a version of it, version of it in Catherine Orenstein's Little Red Riding Hood, Uncloaked. I'll try not to get too technical in this talk, but I should perhaps say something at this point about tale types. Besides tale type indexes for individual countries, there is a standard three volume book, The Types of International Folk Tales, expanded from the earlier Arna Thompson index by Hans Jörg Uter that lists over 2,000 folktale types, of which the true fairy tales classed as tales of magic make up numbers 300 to 745. These are stories which are told all around the world, especially in Asian and Indo-European cultures. So Little Red Riding Hood can be referred to as ATU333, which sends you straight to this catalog, its summary of the story and its chief variants and references to versions from Estonia and Lithuania and Portugal, Italy and Iraq, and Egypt and so on. So that's a very useful tool for anyone researching fairy tales and how they merge and diverge across cultures and from one storyteller to another. In both, uh, perhaps for someone starting out to explore this fascinating subject, the first port of call should be D.L. Ashleyman's A Guide to Folk Tales in the English Language, which is organized on the same principle but in a more user-friendly way. In both of these books, you will find there is a tale closely related to Red Riding Hood, Household of the Witch, in which a girl, often disregarding warnings not to do so, visits her godmother or grandmother and sees terrible sights, culminating in a vision of the godmother with a horse's head or a head of fire. When she reveals what she has seen, she is killed and eaten. In one German version, the godmother was the devil's wife and the house was hell. In the most matter of fact way, we are simply told the godmother went over and wrung the child's neck. In the version in Grimm, Mother Trudy, the witch, realizing her secret has been, has been discovered, changed the girl into a block of wood and threw it into the fire. And when the wood was blazing, she sat down next to it, warmed herself and said, that really does give off a bright light. 
That tail type is nothing like as popular as Little Red Riding Hood, but it is still very widely distributed. Just as people today watch horror films and frighten each other with ghost stories, so traditional folk tales and fairy tales contain much that is gory and gruesome. One of the fairy tales that survived in the most different versions in England and in the USA where over 20 versions have been recorded is the one best known from the Brothers Grimm as the Juniper Tree or My Mother Slew Me, My Father Ate Me. The Juniper Tree is the story of a jealous stepmother who kills the first wife's child and turns them into stew for the father to eat. Her own child buries the remains which are transformed into a bird that sings a song, revealing the truth of what has happened. In the Grimm's version, which has some literary flourishes, the bird is transformed back into a boy at the end, after the wicked stepmother has been killed by having a millstone dropped on her head. So I suppose that's a happy ending to a story that is otherwise relentlessly miserable. But in the English versions, such as the rose tree, there is no such transformation. The bird's song is quite mournful. My wicked mother slew me. My dear father ate me. My little brother whom I love sits below and I sing above. Stick, stop, stone, dead. In most of the English versions, the two children are sisters called Orange and Lemon. And they include Orange and Lemon. There is one interesting variant, the Yorkshire variant, the satin frock, collected from a 13-year-old girl that dispenses with a supernatural element altogether. It starts, there was once a little girl called Mary who had a satin frock. And her mother told her that if she, if she got a dirty mark on it, she would kill her. So when Mary comes home with mud on the dress, the mother cuts off her head and hangs it in the cellar. When the father comes home, he asks what it is, and she tells him it's a sheep's head she's going to make broth from. As he eats the broth, he says, this broth is nice, but it does taste like our Mary. After realisation dawns, he takes his wife down into the cellar and kills her. The sheer brutality of this telling is quite shocking. It was printed in 1896 by the folklorist Sidney Oldall Addy. The previous year, in his household tales, Addy had published a kind of happy counterpart to the usual grisly orange and lemon story. It's called The Broken Pitcher, in which the put-upon orange breaks her pitcher when she goes to the well, but a fairy appears and restores it, and in fact makes it even better than before because the pitcher now has arms and legs, enabling it to do all the household chores that had previously been left to orange. The interesting thing about the broken pitcher is that rather than being a tale handed down in oral tradition generation after generation, it was based on a story, Patty and her pitcher, in the book Mother Goose's Nursery Rhymes and Fairy Tales, published around 1880. This brings us to an important point about the fairy tale which is that there is a lot more cross-contamination between the spoken word and the written word than folklorists like to admit. A case in point is one of the most chilling English folk tales first published in the, folklore, in the journal Folklore in 1955, The Pear Drum. It tells of two sisters called Blue Eyes and Turkey, who lived in a little house on a moor with their mother and the baby. One day they are out walking when they meet a gypsy girl playing a mysterious instrument called a pear drum. As she played, a little man and woman came out of the drum and danced. Of course, Blue Eyes and Turkey long for the pear drum. And the girl promises to give it to them, but only if they are very bad. So when they get home, they shouted and spilled their food and refused to go to bed and scribbled on their books. But next day, the gypsy girl refuses to give them the pear drum because they hadn't been naughty enough. So next day they're behaving even worse, but still they don't get the pear drum. You must be really naughty, they're told. This time they broke the chairs and smashed the china and tore their clothes to pieces and whipped the dog and struck the baby and beat the mother, their mother with their fists. Their mother said sadly, blue eyes and turkey, you must not be so naughty. If you do not stop, I shall have to go away and instead there will come a new mother with glass eyes and a wooden tail to live with you. 
Next day, the girls get up early and go out on the moor to meet the gypsy girl. They find her, but she does not have the pear drum. The gypsies are moving on and they have taken the pear drum with them. Blue Eyes and Turkey wandered about on the moor all day, but when evening came, they went back to their house. There were no lamps lit, but in the glow of the firelight, they could see through the window the glitter of their new mother's glass eyes and hear the thump of her wooden tail. This chilling tale has its origi origin in a short story by Mrs. Lucy Clifford, The New Mother, first published in her book, Any House Stories in 1899. That story is 44 pages long. Co-opted into folklore, the printed tale takes up two pages, and yet all the key elements of the original are there. Moving from the printed to the sp spoken word has refined and condensed the source. The potent images of Lucy Clifford's story are of the kind to linger in the mind. The first great historian of children's literature, F.J. Harvey Darton, was haunted by the new mother with her glass eyes and wooden tail, and wrote that, getting on for 50 years after I met her first, I still cannot rid my mind of that fearful creation. And then you might find yourself reading Coraline by Neil Gaiman, published in 2002, and come to the passage where Coraline walks through the door into the mirror image of her parents' apartment and be chilled to the bone when she finds her other mother there, whose eyes were big black buttons. Lucy Clifford's new mother has made the transition into the new mother of the pear drum and via that story into Neil Gaiman's imagination. His other mother is just as haunting as her predecessors, though his story, dark and frightening as it is, does have a happy ending. Thinking about the ways in which stories and ideas about stories pass to and fro between storytellers, between cultures, and between print and the spoken word has made me much less concerned than I once was about questions of authenticity in the fairy tale. In the 1880s, Marie Clotilde Balfour collected folk tales in the Lincolnshire Fens, and the stories she unearthed were so extraordinary and so different in tone and content from anything else collected in Lincolnshire or indeed in England, that doubts were raised as to whether they actually were records of oral narratives. Doubts I shared in my book, English Folk Tales in 1992. Since then, a PhD thesis by Maureen James has proved pretty conclusively that the stories are genuine folk tradition, recorded by Clotilde Balfour as best she could. James has tentatively identified four of Balfour's storytellers, and explains the feverish nature of the stories told as a result of regular and excessive consumption of opium. Malaria was endemic in the Fens and widely self-managed with opium. But in a way, my view now is that it doesn't really matter where the stories sprang from so much as that they exist. Uh, there are problems with Balfour's idiosyncratic rendition of the dialect, and I'm going to translate that into standard English in discussing the stories here. Balfour's 12 tales represent collectively, as I wrote in English folk tales, a high achievement of the Gothic imagination. Here's a description of a man in the grip of the horrors from the dead moon, told by a nine-year-old disabled girl, Agnes Bratton and all the evil thoughts and deeds of his life came and whispered in his ears and danced about and shouted out the secret things of his own heart till he shrieked and sobbed with pain and shame. The same girl told a story, Samuel's ghost, in which death is personified as a worm. And the same motif is found in one of Balfour's most troubling and grisly stories, The Flying Children. It concerns a man who seduces a girl by falsely promising to marry her and saying that if he doesn't, may the worms eat me and the children have wings and fly away. They have children and he gets them a house by the simple means of murdering the man who lives there, chopping off his hands and feet to feed to the pigs and burying the corpse in a shallow grave with one arm sticking out of the ground. He goes off to catch a rabbit, leaving the girl alone in the house. She hears the pigs raising a commotion and finds the severed feet, which are threatening to trample the pigs unless she buries them. So she buries the feet, 
that the pigs lay down and die. They've been choked to death by the hands, which also demand to be buried. Even after she's done that, the hands and feet are still complaining because they can't find the rest of the body. So she digs them up and reburies them where the old man's arm is sticking out of the ground. Presently, the young man comes home and demands his dinner. He asks after the children and the girl says they're gathering berries in spring. No, they've gone fishing. What, even the baby? Next morning, he asks again and he, she admits that the children have flown away. So he takes his axe, chops her into pieces and shoves them under the bed. When the flying children come home, they want their mother. When they find out what he has done, they chop him up and fly away, weeping. As soon as the young man realizes that he himself is dead, he shakes himself and stands up. And there is the murdered girl, standing, waiting for him, with her long claws out and her teeth gibbering and her eyes blazing like a green cat, ready to spring. The young man flees, calling on thunder, then fire, then water, then the axe to kill him, but they can't because he's dead already. Finally, he calls on the worms to eat him, to save him from the dreadful apparition of the girl he betrayed and killed. By and by up crept, crept a great worm, and a strange and great thing it was with the girl's head on the end of its long, slimy body. Eat me quick, eat me quick, he squeals, to which the chilling answer is, good food's worth the meal time. Another of Mrs. Balfour's stories, Yallery Brown, is a version of the tale type The Spirit in the Bottle, in which a man releases an angry spirit from captivity and only escapes its vengeance by tricking it back into the bottle. The author Alan Garner calls Yallery Brown the most powerful of all English fairy tales. Unusually, it was told to her in the first person as the actual experience of the teller. It tells of a young farm lad named Tom on his way home one night, hears a pitiful sobbing. Searching for what could be making this terrible noise, he lifts a heavy stone and underneath it discovers a creature the size of a year old baby with yellow hair and skin so wrinkled it looks as if it were hundreds of years since it was young and smooth. This is Yallery Brown. What kind of a fairy creature he is, the story doesn't say. In Lincolnshire, he would usually be called a boggart. Yallery Brown offers the lad a beautiful wife, gold or help with his work as a reward for freeing him, but says that if the lad ever thanks him, he will help him no more. Tom chooses help with his work, and sure enough, he never has to do a hand's turn because Yallery Brown has always done it first. But things start to go wrong. But just as Yallery Brown does the lad's work for him, so he undoes the work of the other labourers. So they gang up on Tom and get him fired. Tom summons Yallery Brown and in a temper tells him, I'll thank thee to leave me alone. And now he's gone and done it. He's thanked Yallery Brown, the one thing he was specifically told not to. And for the rest of his life, everything went awry. There'll be no end to Yallery Brown's spite at me. Day in and day out, I hear him saying, work as thou wilt, I'll never do well. Work as thou mount, they'll never gain out. A harm and mischance and yallery brown, thou's let out thyself from under the stone. Marie Clotilde Balfour was a cousin of the writer Robert Louis Stevenson. And it's interesting to note that Stevenson also wrote a version of The Spirit in the Bottle, his wonderful story set on Hawaii, The Bottle Imp. Besides the brothers Grimm, the most famous name in fairy tales is that of Hans Christian Andersen. But unlike the Grimm's who collected orally told traditional tales, Andersen made his stories up. Many of his tales end bleakly. The last line of his last tale, Auntie Toothache, is, everything ends up in the rubbish. His most persistent themes are grief, suffering, shame and disillusion. To say that Anderson was not happy in his skin is to understate the extent of his inner misery, which is on show throughout his diaries, but sanitized in his self-serving autobiography, The Fairy Tale of My Life. It is in his fairy tales that Anderson tells the true story of his inner life, 
Anderson is rarely comfortable with happy endings. He is, in essence, a poet of human suffering. If Anderson had read A Divine Looking Glass by the Muggletonian prophet John Reeve, he would have had great fellow feeling with Reeve's exclamation, Oh, that I had never been born, or that I had been a toad, or any other created being but a man. Anderson, in fact, imagined himself as a toad, as well as a duckling, a snail, a snowman, and every kind of inanimate object from a darning needle to a teapot. And almost all these self-incarnations are infused with melancholy, like the steadfast tin soldier whose paint is all worn away, whether from the hardships of his journey or the bitterness, bitterness of his grief, no one could tell. The scantness of Anderson's upbringing is well known, and anyone who has stood in the tiny one-room apartment where he lived with his mother and father, which was also his father's cobbler's workshop, will understand the desperation of such extreme poverty. Images of his pauper childhood flicker through the opening scenes of his jagged masterpiece, The Snow Queen. The horror of his washerwoman mother's alcoholism sears through the little known story, She Was No Good, in which he depicts her standing knee deep in the freezing river for hours, sustained only by swigs from her bottle. It's the washerwoman, the mayor says, drunk again. She's no good. It's a shame for that lad of hers. I feel sorry for him. His mother is no good. Anderson certainly felt that shame keenly. He was also bitterly ashamed of his half-sister, Karen Marie, who, like his aunt, worked as a Copenhagen prostitute. He distanced himself from her by calling her my mother's daughter and always dreaded her appearance at his door. He took revenge in his most, merciless, most merciless story, The Red Shoes, in which a girl named Karen is punished for her sinful delight in her new shoes by being made to dance till she begs for her feet to be cut off. Anderson was merciless to himself too, to his vanity, his hypochondria, his, his, his attention seeking, his ridiculous hypersensitivity. In a story where he imagines himself as a snail, the snail says, I spit at the world, it's no good. And the last paragraph is simply, shall we read this story all over again? It'll never be different. It's no exaggeration to say that just as the Grimm's have influ influenced every collector of folk narratives that came after them, so Hans Christian Andersen has influenced every writer of original fairy tales. That influence is particularly strongly felt in the later 19th century and is strikingly evident, for instance, in the fairy tales of Oscar Wilde. The best of Wilde's fairy tales, The Fisherman and His Soul, reworks and intertwines the themes of two of Anderson's most tragic tales, The Little Mermaid and The Shadow. The fisherman's love for the mermaid in Wilde's powerful story ends not in triumphant happiness, but with the young fisherman lying drowned in the surf and clasped in his arms was the body of the little mermaid. Beneath the dazzling rippled surface of tales such as the fisherman and his soul and the happy prince is a powerful undertow of sadness. Though written at the height of Wilde's worldly success, they seem to foreshadow his downfall and embody in their strange anguished beauty the insight Wilde expressed in his letter from his prison, De Profundis. There are times when sorrow seems to me to be the only truth. Other things may be illusions of the eye or the appetite, made to blind the one and cloy the other. But out of sorrow have the worlds been built, and at the birth of a child or a star there is pain. Fairy tales in which, as in one Greek Cinderella, Little Saddle Slut, the wicked sisters kill and eat their mother, or as in the donkey skin Cinderella variants, a king desires to marry his own daughter, may give us pause for thought about our casual assumption that the natural audience of such fairy tales is young children. Many of the concerns of the fairy tale don't seem especially suitable to such an audience. It is true that the protagonists of fairy tales are generally young, but they are usually young adults rather than children. 
Fairy tales such as Hansel and Gretel, in which the protagonists are children, are relatively rare. And even in Hansel and Gretel, the central theme of child neglect and abuse is not something that would immediately spring to mind when asked for a bedtime story. Fairy tales are in fact often violent, erotic and dark. When Angela Carter published her collection of short stories, The Bloody Chamber in 1979, her revelation of what she called the latent content of the traditional stories caused widespread shock. It wasn't as if this latent content had been hidden. All of it, the incest, the child abuse, the transgressive sexuality, the violence, suffering and retribution had been on full public view in every collection of traditional tales. But readers convinced that these were safe stories for children had simply overlooked the darker subtext. It took Angela Carter to inquire just how we got to the stage where stories in which a girl's hands are cut off, or a child is served up in a pie, or a serial killer preys on a succession of masochistically submissive wives, came to be regarded as the natural stories to tell to children. She found her answer in her concurrent reading of a previous master of the dark and twisted fairy tale, the Marquis de Sade. It was Sard, I believe, who helped to discern the narrative of suffering and desire in the fairy tale. The last three stories in the Bloody Chamber are variations on the theme of Little Red Riding Hood, a Red Riding, who a Red Riding Hood who understands that the worst wolves are hairy on the inside, a Red Riding Hood whose end can be foreseen from the start. See, sweet and sound she sleeps in Granny's bed, between the paws of the tender wolf. So as we've seen, fairy tales may end either happily or unhappily, though happy endings are very much more common. Marina Warner calls the happy ending the defining dynamic of fairy tales, while noting that ordinary misery and its causes are the story's chief concern. Looking through Jones and Crop's folk tales of the Magyars while preparing this lecture, I was struck by how pretty much every story ends with a happy resolution and some variation on. They are living still if they have not died since. May they be your guests tomorrow. Or if they have not died since, they are still alive and in great happiness to this day. Storytellers often use end formulas like this to insert themselves into a story, as Mrs. Macmillan did in her Scottish Gaelic version of Snow White, the King of Ireland's daughter. It ends, and they made a great, merry, mirthful, happy, hospitable, wonderful wedding. It was kept up for a year and a day. I got shoes of paper there on a glass pavement, a bit of butter on an ember, porridge in a creel, a great coat of chaff, and a short coat of buttermilk. I hadn't gone far when I fell and the glass pavement broke, the short coat of buttermilk spilt, the butter melted on the ember, a gust of wind came and blew away the great coat of chaff. All I had had was gone and I was as poor as I was to start with and I left them there. So that one has a downbeat though delightful coda to the happiest of happy endings. A true unhappy ending on the other hand is regarded by Satu Apo in her brilliant study of the narrative world of Finnish fairy tales was unusual enough to remark on. She discusses the tale Two Boys, in which the heroes are rewarded with a money producing purse and a bag that produces anything wished for. But these typical magical objects cease to have any power after a certain time. The tale has an unhappy ending, contrary to the conventions of the genre. The heroes end up poor. But there is a third way to end a story. One of the greatest of all creators of fairy tales, Rabbi Nachman of Bratislav, who was performing his inspired deconstructions of traditional folk tales at exactly the same time as the Grimms were collecting their folk tale texts, simply refuses to end two of his most important tales. The fairy tales of Rabbi Nachman have deep roots in both the Yiddish and Slavic folk tale traditions and in Oriental story cycles. But instead of collecting the tales as the Grimm's did, Nachman took them apart and remade them as Angela Carter was to do. It was Rabbi Nachman's belief that in the original cataclysm of creation, the divine Big Bang, all the elements of the true and eternal story of redemption were scattered through the world to be pieced hap haphazardly together in the form of fairy tales. In the tales which other people tell, he said, 
There are many secrets and lofty matters, but the tales have been ruined in that they are lacking much. They are confused and not told in the proper sequence. What belongs at the beginning, they tell at the end and vice versa. Nachman's recognition of the way in which traditional fairy tales are constructed from the building blocks of story motifs predates that of folklorists by several generations. In disassembling the stories he heard and creating them anew, he understood storytelling as an act of repair and restoration of a broken world. Nachman responded to the deep structure of the fairy tale with a unique creative passion. One of the great pleasures of reading Rabbi Nachman's tales is to enjoy the beautiful play of his mind as he takes apart the traditional fairy tale and reassembles it into something new and wonderful. For instance, in his first fairy tale, The Lost Princess, Nachman melds two tale types, the quest for the vanished princess and the accursed daughter. In the former, the hero rescues a princess who has been imprisoned in the underworld by a monster. In the latter, man seeks to marry a girl who has been carried off by the devil because of her mother's careless words. In Rabbi Nachman's hands, this becomes a story of mankind's spiritual quest to rescue the Shekinah, the representation of God's divine presence in the world from the clutches of the evil one. In the logic of the traditional fairy tale, the story would end with the king's minister freeing, her, the, freeing the princess, restoring her to her father and winning her hand in marriage. But Nachman's tale breaks short. There is no happy ending. The princess is left in captivity. As Nachman said of his masterpiece, The Seven Beggars, which has a similarly frustrating ending, we will not be worthy to hear it until the Messiah comes. I'm really looking forward to taking your questions and in a moment we'll be handing you back to Joseph. But first, I'd just like to thank you, Joseph, for inviting me to give this talk and also to thank everyone who has helped to organise it. Thank you. Thank you. That was really wonderful. Um, if, I wonder if we might be able to activate um, people if they would like or Type in your, Kimberly, can you turn on the chat? Is that possible? And uh, let's see if we can, uh, I got a question. We can, I can try to unmute you and we can give that a shot. Just, I know that's Neil's preference. Or you can just type it in if that's easier. I'll get us started. Maybe I can ask a question real quick. Um, <clears throat> I'd like you, I think you could talk a little bit more about our um, association of children and tales. Why, why you think that? It really, I mean, it starts valuable. with the Grimm's that they called their collection first children's and household tales. And then by children's and household tales, the, the, the children's section was, was really quite short. Um, but as they um, prepared new editions of, of their book, they realized that children were being read these stories and they, they, they softened um, quite a lot of the elements of the stories. So evil mothers become evil stepmothers, for instance. Um, and so, that started the idea that these stories, which were originally entertainments for adult audiences, were actually meant for children. Um, and then by the end of the 19th century, you get really influential um, series of books of fairy tales like Andrew Lang's Colour Fairy books, of which he did 12, which are explicitly aimed at children and the stories have equally been um, softened um, and made more acceptable for a child audience. Um, and so that's the beginning of our assumption that fairy tales are expected to be uh, enjoyed by children rather than adults. Thank you. 
few other questions here in the chat. Um, Sophia, do you want to? Yeah. Uh, Craig Funken asks, what do you think the appeal, aesthetic or psychological, of sad, tr of sad tragic fairy tales is? Um, I think it is the same as the appeal of, of things like horror films and gothic novels. You know, people people like to wallow in sadness and tragedy. Um, it's, it's, it's just part of human nature that people like sad things as well as happy things. I mean, it, 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 it's, it is fair to say that the majority of traditional fairy tales do end up with a happy ending, but they put the um, poor protagonists, both male and female, through the most terrible suffering and troubles and on the way. Um, so, you know, the, ha the happy ending, what uh, Tolkien called a eucatastrophe, is, uh, is won through suffering rather than uh, easily won. Um, I guess I'll ask the next question. Um, someone that, um, let's see, I'll say, someone asks, uh, Nadia Soto asks, what's in your interest in studying uh, folk and fairy tales? Where that gets your interest? Um, it's hard to pinpoint exactly. I mean, I think um, it, it really, it may have partly grown from really loving Tolkien as a teenager um, and then getting interested in, in fantasy literature and that drew me to fairy tales and um, myth um, and I um, did my PhD on um, myth and folklore in children's literature um, and then after that I've, I've just kept up the, the very strong interest um, in in both in, in all three of those areas mythology folklore and, and children's literature um davidi johnson asks what do you think people have edited the original fairy tales to something that can now be read to children well I mean, the, the Victorians were, well, the, the 19th century people, let's not say Victorians because the Grimm's first edition came out in 1812. Um, they were very sort of prudish about what, what was suitable for children and what wasn't. And I mean, it's interesting now that some of the things they thought was suitable, like terribly violent retributions at the end of fairy tales, like Cinderella's sisters getting their eyes pecked out by doves you know, or people being made to dance in red hot iron shoes, they regarded as perfectly acceptable. Um, but uh, they tried to edit out sort of sexual elements um, and things like that. And it's, it's just part of the transition of, of these stories from an inherited oral folkloric inheritance to um, a literary one. Um, and then people like Angela Carter have tried to put, put back in all the uh, things that were taken out or obscured. Um, uh, Ginny O'Gorman asks uh, if you could talk about uh, any correlations between the type of fairy tale which is popularized at a particular time and the wider social context of that time. Why certain fairy tales become popular at any given moment. Um, I think you could, there are obviously uh, political and, and social um, elements to the reception and the retelling of fairy tales. Um, and uh, the Grimm's, for instance, have a very patriarchal worldview um, and, and uh, that, that's influenced the fairy tale in, in, a, in a negative way, I think, ever since. Um, so, uh, to, you know, your people are left with the feeling that all fairy tale heroines are, are, are just passive um, instruments, um, whereas there are plenty and plenty and plenty of traditional fairy tales with really strong, active female heroines. We apologize if your question got lost in the chat. There's so much participation, which is beautiful. Um, but Barbara requested if 
it might be possible that you put the titles and the authors of the books you mentioned in the chat, possibly after um, we wrap up the conversation. But um, another yeah. question that comes yeah. in from, yeah. thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll do a little list of, of the things that I mentioned um, just when we finish, if that's all right. I don't think I can do it while I'm actually still speaking. <laughs> That's a good idea. And another question that comes in from Alexander is, what was the fairy tale called where Tom finds the crying blonde creature again? Oh, uh, it's called Yallery Brown. Y-A-L-L-E-R-Y Brown. Um, and uh, you, can, you can find that in, um, actually the best version of it uh, that is easily found is in Alan Garner's um, Book of Goblins, which has been republished in expanded form um, as his, uh, I think it says Complete, Complete Fairy Tales, I think it's called. Um, the, the version in Joseph Jacobs' English Fairy Tales was rewritten into the third person, which takes away quite a lot of the distinctive tone of the, uh, the story. So the, the Jacobs version is, is very readable too. Um, I've got a question here from Matthew Tobin. i modify it just slightly. This is a great question. He talks about how um, the violence in fairy tales, he says, seems to have been into popular culture for children via cartoons such as Loons and Tom and Jerry. And it, it, thinking yeah. about as you're reading some or in summarizing some of the stories uh, this afternoon, I couldn't help but laugh because the tortures are so ridiculous. So I was wondering, do you think as stories are told that humor is, you know, a crucial part of the tale, or is it just is it supposed to be yeah, horrific? I, I think so. And I mean, actually, uh, I think it's a very good point that Matt Rett makes that that this this it, the, the violence is it, it is quite comic, you know, in a way. Um, and actually, I, I thought of doing a section in the talk on comic tales that end badly, because there are quite a lot. Um, but I, I didn't make it into the final cut. Um, but yes, no, the, the, those, uh, the, there is a cartoony element to it. Um, yeah. I wonder even, like, I remember when I was read, or when my my uh, father told me a uh, little hood as a little kid. At the end, he would always say, "You know, the better the death," and then like me and go rawr, you know. And it was it was it was really a, a joyful kind of moment, even though he's telling me a story about a child that gets eaten by a, a wolf. Yeah. So I guess it depends on the content and how it's told, and yeah, and 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 lots of. Um... In English fairy tales, there's in folk tales, there's quite a lot of them. You know, the recorder says, "Oh, I was told this by my childhood nurse." You know, um, and Dickens records quite a few fairy tales that his nurse uh, Mary Weller told him. Um, and and, and nursemaids specialised in stories that frighten the living daylights out of their charges. <laughs> They're really, really frightening and horrible. Um, and uh, you know, it was just one of the, one of the things that was regarded as perfectly okay. It was telling these really frightening, scary stories to children. De oh, sorry, Defeaty Johnston asks, "Why do you think people have edited the original fairy tales to something to be read for children?" Um, well, it's partly to do with the economics of publishing, I think. Um, you know, the, the, apart from scholarly editions, which um, go to a very uh, small circle of people who are really keen on, on the, the fairy tale, um, the, the market for fairy tales is, is in the children's books market. Um, so I, I think that's it, really. Anna Gassaway is asking, do you think there will be a fairy tale that will be of the pandemic, for example, resilience? Um, I think we'll have to wait and see. I mean, I think there's going to be an awful lot of pandemic literature, both for adults and for children. 
Um, but if someone's going to make a fairy tale out of it, hard to know. I mean, you can make fairy tales out of almost anything. Um, the, the, there's a fairy tale recorded in America, which basically um, is, is an explanation of uh, the Irish famine and why only Americans um, emigrated to America. Um, and it's a story about death getting shut up in a box and then the box landing on the shores of Ireland and these two guys who find it break it open and, and death who's been imprisoned in there for ages bursts out and starts killing people re recklessly um, and they will have to flee. Um, so yeah, I can, Im I can imagine a pandemic fairy tale. Uh, I'll ask a question really quick. This is from uh, Erica. Uh, uh, she writes, Neil, it's refreshing to hear a scholarly identify ways their, th their scholar identify ways their thinking has changed, as you mentioned with the Finn's tale, yeah. or your conception of authenticity and its value or otherwise. Have you experienced any other major shifts in your scholarly thinking over the decades? Um, hmm. Well, that's, I mean, that's certainly a concrete example of something where I, uh, uh, my mind has been changed by someone else's scholarship. Um, I, I think I'm very much more aware of the individual voice of the storyteller in a story. And that's what I value in any particular story is to feel this is this person's story and they've really nailed it. Um, rather than having a more sort of generic interest in, um, you know, Snow White stories, let's say. Um, so I think that the, that and an interest in all the other elements that make up a story that aren't just the plot, you know, the, the language, the cadences, the intonations, the pauses, um, the, the gesticulations, um, and the, uh, relation between the storyteller and the audience um, which is a very potent dynamic thing in storytelling um, so i think i mean i think that my my thinking about folk and fairy tales has remained sort of much the same but deepened and widened i think i would say um, but but there, obviously there are the odd things like uh, Mrs. Balfour's stories where I, I, I've had a change of heart um, and thought, no, you know, they're, they're, um, and I suppose I've, I've just written actually for the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, um, the biography of a woman called Ruth Tongue, who was a very famous storyteller um, in the second half of the 20th century in England. Um, and my initial attitude was to Ruth Tongue was that she was basically a fraud um, and then, which I thought as soon as I heard recordings of her actual voice which was very cut glass um, upper class English um, and her storytelling voice which is a very sort of heavily accented Somerset um, dialect um, and I thought this is not something not right here but actually learning more about tongue I, I i begin to think well she's she's not correct in what in what she says about where she learned these stories and who she learned them from because you know it doesn't stack up but actually it just makes her more interesting as a creative storyteller because she's actually you know basically making all this stuff or stuff up or someone said well she can be said to collect from herself which I thought was a very polite way of putting it really. Um, I've got another question if I may this is Jack Zipes um, he asks how important are illustrations do you think there are massive differences in the illustration of the 19th century in our present century illustrators uh, like Lytus receiving the attention and they deserve? Yeah, I think, I mean, there's a whole lot of work to be done on fairy tale illustration. Um, but yes, they're, they're very important. I mean, especially when you get into the realm of, of uh, fairy tale books for children. Um, and the illustrators don't always get 
um, they're just desserts. Um, of course, you start, I mean, you, it's not until Lang's Ferry Books, I think, or, or maybe um, Walter Crane's, that you start getting these full color illustrations in fairy books. Generally speaking, you've got black and white drawings or whatever uh, before that. Um, and so the Lang's Ferry Books were illustrated by Henry Justice Ford. He did beautiful line drawings and, and color plates. Um, and Walter Crane did these individual picture books of um, fairy tales with, with beautiful um, uh, woodblock prints, um, which are really stunning things. Um, and, and you get a very different feeling of reading, let's say, Beauty and the Beast in, in a Crane edition and in a Henry Justice Ford edition or in some more modern illustrator. Um, so yes, I mean, I think that, you know, a, re a really good book on all the different approaches that fairy tale illustrators have had would be great. Um, and uh, yes. CR um, Franken asks. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. And we're, we're getting close to, I guess it's 108 we can ask questions, but it's exhausting to sit here at the, um, in front of the Zoom cameras and these chairs for so long. So let's have a few, a few more questions and then we'll begin wrapping things up. Right, CR Franken asks, this is inspiring. Thank you for being here. What about the topic of bullying in fairy tales? What are the remedies and revenges or the bad outcomes inside, outside of the target? Of, of bullying, did you say? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I feel sorry for some of the um, poor, you know, characters in fairy tales. I mean, there's, uh, I just get a book here. I've got a crying cat coming behind me. Um, this is the uh, folk tales of the Magyars that I mentioned earlier. And it's got a story in it called The World's Most Beautiful Woman. Um, which is basically Snow White. Um, and at the end of it, you're so, uh, there's two wicked people. There's a witch and there's the mother who is uh, desperate to be the most beautiful person. And it's so awful. They ask the old witch at the end why she persecuted her. Because I am the daughter of your grandfather and the sister of your mother. When I was yet but a suckling babe, your grandmother gave orders that I was to be thrown into the water. A devil coming along the road took me and educated me. I humoured your mother's folly because I thought she would go mad in her sorrow that a prettier creature than herself existed. But the Lord has preserved you and your mother did not go mad till I covered her with smallpox and her face became all pitted and scarred. Her mirror was always mocking her and she became a wandering lunatic, roaming about over the face of the land and the children pelting her with stones. And it goes on like this, paragraphs doing terrible things to these poor women. Um, and you feel, you know, at the end that they, they really have been bullied. Um, but the, uh, equally, you know, there's, a, there's all the bullying of the fairy tale heroines and heroes who are always, you know, the youngest child who's, uh, given all the hard work to do and um, not given all the uh, attention and rewards of the older children. Ask another question uh, really quick. This is, we have some poets here, including uh, uh, the editor of the Poetry International. And uh, so I was wondering if you might talk a bit, a bit about lyricism in some of these folk tales you know, the sonic oral qualities of the, the language itself, and also um, appearance of, of verb within some of these oral tales. Yeah, the, the, I mean, the, the verses are interesting. I mean, Joseph Jacobs was very, in the 19th century, was convinced that what he called the Kant fable, this is stories with verses in them, were the oldest form of the folk tale. And, you know, uh, I, I, I'm not convinced by that argument at all, really. But, you know, there, there are quite a lot of tales that have um, verses scattered through them. 
I'm just going to try and find something if I can to read a bit of, of uh, where am I going to? Hmm. Uh, this is a bit of uh, um, a fairy tale called Sorrow and Love. Uh, it's another English gypsy tale collected by T.W. Thompson um, from a man called Gus Gray. Uh, Gus Gray he described as a man of beautiful speech. Um, and this is a description of uh, a horse the bit was hard back in her mouth and the foam flying like big flakes of snow. The veins on her neck was standing out like rope, the sweat dripping off her like a hail of bullets. Her chestnut coat black with sweat and shiny like jet. She was all of a dither. At a touch she'd have jumped out in her skin. Um, and I think that's a, an example of a kind of lyrical poetry in storytelling that is actually, you know, quite common. I mean, some storytellers are very plain. Um, you know, they're, 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 they're just very sort of plain and direct. Um, and then there are storytellers who absolutely love to embroider and, and make beautiful phrases and beautiful cadences. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it, it, it's an important part. I mean, and also, a lot of the poetry of a fairy tale lies in in the the strings of images with which they're made. Um, storytellers with repertoires of fairy tales seem to have two distinct ways of remembering their stories. One is by remembering them in in terms of words and trying basically to tell the story in the same words every time. But another way is to remember them as images and to almost to watch the story unfold like a, a, a film and then just describe what they're seeing. So it's a, it, you know, you, you, they've either got a verbal imagination and memory or a visual one. Um, and uh, again, to, to quote Joseph Jacobs again, he may have a very lovely phrase about fairy tales, fairy tales unfolding in bright trains of images. Um, and so he obviously felt about fairy tales rather in the way of this visual uh, method of remembering them. Um, Are there, I think, if we wonder, it doesn't look like there's any new questions. There's lots of thank yous and I second them. Uh, thank you so much for, for doing this and um, you know, writing this whole paper Apologize to those of you who got here um, late because I I foolishly forgot about Kenya going having daylight savings time or springing forward on Sunday. That's my fault. I, I saw Jack show up at Jack Zipes uh, up a little bit late. I, I fear that that may be my mistake. Uh, but I really would like to thank you so much and uh, second everyone else's thanks. Uh, there's so many uh, chats I've gotten here um, about how wonderful this, your lecture was. So thank you so much. I, could, um, I wish you could hear a round of applause, but <laughs> it's not gonna be possible. So I'll do it for you. Uh, Nick Campbell says, thank you for the wonderful talk. I wish it was twice as long. Do you think this radical variation in content and tone tells us something about the genre of fairy tales and the way tales subvert or influence one another? Hang on, in the way, I didn't get the last phrase. In the, the way tales subvert or influence one another. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that the, the, there's a there's a bit of call and response that goes on between fairy tales, um, and and uh, a, a bit like when I was talking about the anti fairy tale and the fairy tale, they, they, there's a um, definitely a sort of a symbiosis between 
the two genres, if you like. Um, yeah, so uh, I think that um, there are some fairy tales which are almost answers to other fairy tales. Um, and, and you can see as well in the way that, uh, you know, because these tale types that I've discussed are, are very fluid. Um, and you can, a storyteller can, can meld two together. They can tell one and then just segue into uh, another. Um, and uh, so you can have like a version of Cinderella that goes on after the marriage. Um, there's an Irish one called Fair Brown and Trembling. Uh, they're three sisters. Uh, Trembling is a Cinderella figure and she marries the king. Um, and, but her sister Fair throws her into the sea and she's swallowed by a whale. Um, and while she's in the whale's belly, Fair goes back and tells the king that she is trembling. And because they all look so alike, the king can't tell. Um, and so the Fair tries to take Trembling's place as the bride. Um, and so that's uh, 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 basically it's another fairy tale that's been added on for the Cinderella bit. Um, and, and that happens all the time. Uh, There's the, um, you know, Perrault's um, Sleeping Beauty, which has the, seems like to a lot of my students to be, a, a, you know, an a extra you know, after the prince and she get married and then the queen, his, the prince's mother wants to hear her and the, all that business at the end of Perot's Sleeping Beauty. A lot of my students only know the story after he yeah. kisses yeah. her, she wakes up and then they get married and that's the end of the story. Yeah, no, it, it, it's a very good example. Um, and, and, and some fairy tales were immensely long as well, taking, you know, many evenings to tell. Um, there's a, a, a Scottish Gaelic story called um, the story of Cain's leg that goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on. Um, and, and uh, you know, it was partly a, a feat of storytelling that these people had memorized this vast, you know, almost epic thing. Um, and and uh, people would get together and, you know, get the latest installment, like the next installment of a um, soap opera or something. Um. Yeah, that's true. And I wonder if, I was a wonderful writer, but I often wonder if one of the reasons he's so well known and his, his versions of those tales have lasted is because they're so short. Whereas yeah. a lot of his contemporaries wrote very long, like the Yellow yeah, Dwarf. The, the, the French Salon fairy tale is generally overblown and far too literary and, and, and um, trying to make far too clever points about the French society of the time, as it were. Whereas Perrault is, is much more in the service of the story. Um, and he, he is quite brief um, and his his language is crisp. Um, it's it, 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 it's beautiful, but it's it's not too ornate. Um, and and uh, you know he he just he gave us what we think of as the definitive forms of some of these stories. Things like Cinderella, Little Red Riding Hood, um, Sleeping Beauty. You know it's. Um, yeah, he, I mean, he, he got in first for a lot of them too, which is always a good thing for a, for a writer once their work to survive. 